Hello, everyone, and welcome to this session of Core in Action, semester three, um, in which we will, we've made it, we've made it to the chapter of the book entitled In Action Embodied Cognition. So having spent six chapters systematically stripping away assumptions and presumptions about the mind, breaking down the illusions of what seemed like solid foundations to which, on which to build a science of cognition, we arrive now at the positive story. So after last session and last chapter's pivot or, or sort of a hinge chapter, we move from looking back over where we have come from in cognitive science to look forward as to how we might move on. So in that last chapter, Raleigh, Thompson and Roche warned us that we will need to just get over our Cartesian anxieties. In this chapter eight, we're introduced to the perspective or mode of thought that we'll need to adopt in order to make sense of cognition without assumptions that commit us to either realist or idealist ways of thinking. Cognition as embodied action. So in the last 30 years or so, this has become almost a cliche um, since the book was first published. And it's still a difficult concept to really take on and is still used as a result by different researchers in, in many different ways. And um, so it remains still quite difficult to get to grips with. And um, it always takes, we have sort of many analogies and, and metaphors and illustrations for us now to gradually shift our intuitions and orient ourselves to this new perspective. Um, even when we begin sympathetic to the idea though, to move to embodied inactive thinking is not likely something that's easily achieved. It, it takes effort because there's just an inertia to our habits and our intuitions and ways of thought, particularly given how deeply entrenched um, these Cartesian assumptions are in the Western tradition and in particular in the English language. Even the empirical and logical work of the previous six chapters will probably not quite have prepared us um, for, for this. Again, because it just you, you need to sort of practice it a bit. You need to have the, the habit of it. Um, and this too you know, shouldn't be terribly surprising. Uh, but I think it's one of the reasons that people find the book difficult to read um, is that to fully engage, particularly with these later chapters, it's not just a process of understanding them, um, at least not in the old fashioned sense, uh, the, the traditional sort of computational cognitive science sense. It's a matter of changing our habits and intuitions of developing a new practice of conceptualizing things. And so this is both difficult and time consuming and also runs counter to our intuitions of both cognition and science if our intuitions are still informed by these traditional ways of thought. The idea of science that just new information should just change our mind, we should be persuaded by data. Uh, the reality is, of course, that we're people and our habits are not so easily overcome. So, as I said, there's lots of analogies and illustrations that will help us make this move, that will make it more palatable and comprehensive for us. And in other literature, you'll see things like, well, it, the inactive approach is thinking of cognition more like a handshake than a hand or cognition is like a dance. Um, I've come to like the analogy of walking. Uh, if we want to understand walking, it kind of seems obvious that we should pay attention to legs. Um, legs make walking, that much seems obvious. Uh, but if you think about when astronauts who've been in space for a prolonged period return to their ground, their muscles have wasted and their bones have weakened. So legs make walking, but walking also makes legs. What's more, the ground is just as involved in the walking as the legs are. Walking is not something that goes on in the legs. It doesn't come out of the legs and happen to encounter the ground at the end of it. Um, so if we try to understand walking by just looking at the legs or even just looking at the ground, we're going to fail to understand what's actually happening. Indeed, it's not just the legs, it's the whole body, really. And aha, you might be thinking, well, I've got you now, Mary. Uh, Varela, Thompson and Rush have taken away the ground. Um, what ground is it you mean that we're walking on? Um, and of course, the answer to that is actually depends on our feet and what we've got on them. Um, if our feet are bigger or smaller, bumps and lumps in the ground will mean that the walking is different. The ground we encounter will depend on the body that we have and indeed what we're wearing. Um, if you try to walk in high heels on cobblestones or flip flops on sand, uh, you're well aware that the ground that you encounter is entirely dependent on the kinds of ways in which you as an embodied being are engaging with it. Uh, so we can provide all the exhaustive description we want, but there will be no one canonical description of the ground that by itself, without reference to the walker, explains the walking. Uh, so what is it, what then, if we're trying to understand isn't walking, but cognition? What if to understand, we want to understand something more abstract, something that feels more mindy, perception-y, experience-y, consciously, like, for example, 
how we perceive color. Well, for this, we're very fortunate to have as our guide through chapter eight, uh, Dr. Valerie Bonardel. Dr. Bonardel was a student of Francisco Varela at the Institute of the Neurosciences in Pierre Marie Curie University in Paris and pursued her research in the experimental psychology laboratory at the University of Cambridge. Her initial work was concerned with uh, the, the psychophysical aspects of color vision in humans, and she later developed interest in the study of cognitive and cultural aspects of color while um, heading the, 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 being the research chair at the National Institute of Design in India in 2011 to 2012. She's also been the vice chair and chair of the Color Group of Great Britain, and is today a member of the executive committee of the Association Internationale de la Color. In two, 2016, she's also developed modules for um, advanced students in embodied cognition and contemplative practice studies in the Department of Psychology at the University of Winchester. We are therefore, uh, we have no better guide, there can be no better guide indeed to help us through um, this chapter eight of the embodied mind in which we'll it'll, um, encounter fully in action as um, embodied in uh, cognition as embodied action. So I will, I will um, pass the, the chair now to, to Valerie. Um, th thank you, uh, Marek, for, with this uh, very uh, uh, prestigious uh, presentation um, of uh, the, uh, the path I followed uh, from uh, Francisco Varela Laboratory up to today. And uh, I, I will, uh, I hope to, to keep up at the expectation. So, um, Unfortunately, I, I'm not in charge of. Unfortunately, I'm not in charge of the slide. And Joanna kindly um, accepted to uh, present the slide. So the best thing is just to move on uh, with the lecture itself. Right. So we are here together with the embodied mind once again, and I think uh, the once again is uh, actually something that we need to pursue to carry on. And uh, of course, you know very well the triumvirate with um, Francisco Varela, Evan Thompson, and Eleanor Roche. Next slide, please. And with this uh, three uh, uh, picture, I want to, to show that it started in 1991 the dialogue between cognitive science and human experience. And I believe that this has never been so clearly uh, expressed. Then there is a second edition in 2016, and we are here together to carry on this dialogue between cognitive science and human experience. Um, there is, before I go into the chapter eight and talk about color, um, I have several slides which are possibly, you know, disjunct bits. But I couldn't, I, I felt that I couldn't just move to chapter eight, meaning move back to the future without presenting um, some things that get into my mind. And you, I didn't have time to get a synthesis of what I wanted to say. So instead of presenting a, a message, I want to show you things, a uh, fact. Next slide, please. And the, what, one that I am curious about is numbers, you know. Um, I know that chapter eight is not dealing with mindfulness, but you, you are probably very much aware of uh, meditation as, you, you know, a, a possible tool, a methodological tool to investigate the working of the mind, which, again, is not something that we are going to discuss today. But it's interesting to see that I took psychoanalysis and I took you know, the number of publications in PubMed, which is a filter, be careful, because there is a bias. It's uh, essentially medical uh, publication and life science uh, publication. So I'm not saying that those keywords that I have been using reflect exactly when those terms have been coined on how many publications have been done, but it gives you know, an idea for the comparison. So I use psychoanalysis because actually psychoanalysis at some point was also a, an attempt to have a scientific understanding of the mind. And then I'm, you know, I put mindfulness. And as you see, 
we have a steady number of publications across the year in psychoanalysis, as we may expect. And of course, some things that we all recognize, we have this uh, sort of ex uh, exponential number of publications with mindfulness. I have to say that there is one publication in 1982, 81, sorry, uh, which coined the first time mindfulness. But I noted the, in 92, we have the first um, publication with Cabazin. And you see that there is quite a long time, even between 1991 and when there is a development of research, scientific research on uh, mindfulness uh, starting up. Next slide, please. Ah, I did the same thing with embodied cognition. Uh, so for our own information, the first occurrence still with PEBMUD, uh, Med Pub, sorry, was in 2000, and until today, uh, December 2022, was 1,322 occurrence for embodied cognition and for inaction. First occurrence in 2003, and only 87 occurrence from until uh, December 22. Next slide, please. Uh, I wanted also to make a short recap for. Uh, cognition, and actually you all know this conceptual chart of cognitive science, which is presented in the book. And, and this is actually quite um, <clears throat> uh, useful representation. This polar chart indicates at the time what sort of discipline were concurrent to uh, contributing to the cognitive science. And we have Artificial intelligence, which is still there, linguistic philosophy, cognitive psychology, and neuroscience. And um, basically, in the um, uh, laboratory of neuroscience in 91, uh, we had very much influence of neuroscience, cognitive psychology, but also at artificial intelligence because we had team who were working with a robot at the time. And philosophy was mainly from Francisco because it was very much, you know, scientific department. Next slide, please. And we see, sorry, the last thing, cognitivism, emergence, and inactive. So, so that, that is, you know, uh, a timeline uh, toward which um, it was uh, a wishful thinking to, uh, to aim at. Next slide, please. Uh, from cognitive map to the first book on cognitive psychology, that's quickly, I also wanted to put that in uh, a chronological order. Actually, cognition started in 1948, so very early on at the time of behaviorism, when people started to figure out the limit of behaviorism. And the first book on cognitive psychology was 20 years later. Uh, there is uh, a date which is very important, which is 1956, uh, which is the Darmus and MIT conference, where we have to be allegedly the birth date of cognitive science, cognitive psychology, and also the birth date of artificial intelligence. Um, yeah, next slide, uh, next slide. And this cognitive psychology, um, this cognitivism was very much within the information processing uh, framework. So what uh, we want to keep in mind with this slide is actually before cognitivism and cognitionism, we have cybernetic, uh, which is a scientific study of uh, control and communication in the animal and the machine. And that was actually at the roots of both cognitivism and cognitionism. Nevertheless, there is two parallel paths. With cognitivism, information processing as a symbolic computation, symbol represents the world. The, the rules are sequential. Symbolic processing is localized. And cognitivism architecture is far away from a biological inspiration. And computer, as we all know, are the metaphor for the mind. For connectionism, each component operates only on its local environment. So we are at the sub-symbolic level. 
the emergence come from uh, of a global state or on the processing of all these local components. It is a highly distributed network and connectionist architecture are biologically inspired with artificial neural network. And we saw that in uh, 1943 with um, Maculot and Pitts neuron who are directly inspired for, for building up a model and very simple logical operation between units uh, to mimic actually the neuronal functioning. Next slide, please. This parallel between connectionist and uh, cognitivism could be found with the evolution of our technology between the classical computer and the neural engineering. The, the, they born at the same time, actually, because we have the uh, serial computation with the computer, the uh, personal computer in 1948, the Manchester baby. But in 1957, we do have the perceptron from uh, Frank Rosenblatt, uh, who was the first uh, machine to be uh, actually the embryo, I mean, to be the beginning of artificial intelligence. With the arrow, you see that in the green left-hand side, the outcome of serial computation were personal computer, Android and iPhone. And I'm smiling because actually this slide is before 2017. And in fact, iPhone and I believe Android, I don't know the Android, should be on the other side because now there is artificial intelligence implemented since the first iPhone was in 2017 with a bit of a deep learning system in order to uh, implement face recognition to unlock your system. So I didn't update that. And I believe that of course with chat GPT and everything, we are you know, now far away uh, from um, the uh, attempt, I mean not attempt, but the first result with deep neural network applied to computer vision, automatic speech recognition, natural language processing, and implemented in Google and Amazon. And we see today, of course, you know, a much more um, mature uh, system. Next slide, please. Artificial intelligence, um, uh, born in 1956. If the artificial intelligence has been less successful compared to uh, serial computation in a personal computer, it's just because the uh, the technology was not there, but the idea was were already there. So it was just a matter to uh, to uh, have the proper computing power and the number of stimuli that was necessary to train those machines. Next slide, please. And I'm asking you to forgive me because we were in the analogy between cognitivism and um, computer uh, machine. And I couldn't help to show you two visualizations. On the left-hand side is the visualization of the brain connection. Uh, and just to keep in mind that we have uh, 100 billion of known and we have 1,000 more of synapse. Uh, and if we compare that with the network, the internet, with the visualization of the routine, in 2017, there were 3 billion of us typing on our keyboard. Today, uh, we are 520 billion of user, which represent apparently, if we trust those numbers, 65% of the global population. And interestingly as well, is out of this number, there is 60% of the world population which are using the internet for social media. I leave that to you. We will see uh, the five different subsections, recovering the common sense, self-organization revisited, color, color as a case study, cognition as embodied action, and the retreat into the natural selection that will actually uh, lead to the next chapter uh, that will be discussed in two weeks' time. Next slide, please. Recovering the common sense. Um, what I pick up from this subsection was the introduction to say 
cognitive realism in information processing system could do good job for space which are well defined where the rule can be explicited and when the rule are propositional. So we can actually define uh, clearly this space. And for instance, the space of chess would be a good example. But it seems unrealistic to expect to capture the common sense understanding in a form of a representation of a pre-given world. And the example which was given was a space of driving. And I was wondering myself, oh, in that, in that way, you are not necessarily visionary because actually we are getting there because we listen Tesla. We can hear Tesla saying every so often that we are almost there. So we are almost there. So I just look you know, at uh, a publication 2023 for researcher where they are about with this automatic or self-driving uh, system. And what they say, overcoming technology, regulatory, and infrastructure barrier is crucial for safe and efficient deployment of level five. I look at level five autonomous vehicles. Level five is uh, an indication of the risk and taking. So we are still there. And uh, in terms of uh, well-defined space, we had indeed in 2017, as you remember, AlphaGo that beat the world number one player, but nevertheless, there was a bit of, um, not a bit, there was a lot of deep learning, deep mind here. But even though that in the self-driving system, the, um, of course, artificial intelligence is probably there, um, it's like an asymptotic, uh, uh, case that we are almost there. Yes, we are almost there. Next slide, please. Okay, so that is quotation. Knowledge is the result of an ongoing interpretation that emerged from our capacity of understanding. These capacities are rooted in the structure of our biological embodiment but are lived and experienced within a domain of consensual action and cultural history. For some reason, I love this uh, quotation, and uh, I would like to take it as a disclaimer for this present presentation, <laughs> because indeed, uh, this interpretation emerged from our own capacity of understanding. And I believe what we give to our students is actually, you know, developing their own capacity of understanding. It's where we have a high responsibility to provide a scaffolding to develop those capacity of understanding. So the challenge posed to the cognitive science is to question the world independent of the knower, which I felt when I read this uh, title, uh, Cognitive Psychology in the Changing World. Uh, how do you feel, you know, with this kind of title? If we are forced to admit that cognition cannot be properly understood without this common sense that we are really talking about, and that common sense is none other than how bodily and social history, then the inevitable conclusion is that the knower and the known, mind and world, stand in relation to each other through mutual specification or dependent co-origination. And it's what we will try to, um, to sense uh, a bit more with the color as an example. Next slide, please. Self-organization revisited, and I will be extremely short on that um, uh, because the bit of you, I skip the bit of you, but I keep the concept of emergent property which are those properties that arise through interaction among smaller parts that alone do not exhibit this such property. And we move to enhancing this definition of emergent property with the next slide, please, by the structural coupling. The structural coupling comes from our sensory guided action it brings forth a world of relevance to the system, an history of coupling between the internal dynamic and the milieu will become a significant distinction for the system. So we see that uh, congruence between the environment and the system and how a world is described as 
enacted through a history of structural coping. Next slide, please. And now we dip into color as a case study for embodied cognition. So the author tell us why they choose color as embodied as a, a case study for embodied cognition. First, the study of color provides the microscope of cognitive science. Cognitive science, as we describe it in the polar uh, diagram I show you earlier. So uh, artificial intelligence, uh, linguistic, uh, neuroscience, cognitive psychology, but we could also, uh, with color, move to physics, of course, and also move to art, uh, artistic expression. The, 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 second, the second point which um, really opened my eyes when I, I read that years ago and that Francisco had already thought about, uh, which I also find uh, very interesting, is that color has an immediate perceptual and cognitive significance in the human experience. And uh, as uh, a student, when we learn about the visual system, we learn that they are primitive, such as contrast, orientation, movement, uh, location, and color. And uh, I was always thinking, well, all these um, primitive have no nonsense in themselves, you know, an orientation, a contrast, a location, not, not very, um, not carrying many uh, symbolic value at all. Whereas color does immediately, and, and actually to the point that there are some anthropological work that shows that color might have been the first uh, system used to develop uh, a symbolic culture. So in other words, it could predate the language, which is much more complex and evolved. So, so this is what is extremely attractive because it's both a elementary feature and in the same time, it does convey uh, meaning. So color we see must be located not in a pre-given word, but rather in the passive word, brute force from our structural coupling. And it's what we will try to move on smoothly. Next slide, please. Color appearance. What is, uh, how we describe how a color appearance? And uh, the way it is explained is to make a distinction between a unique U or unitary U and a binary U. And this is how color appearance. A patch cannot, can be reddish yellow, it's orange. Uh, we can mix you know, two light and get that. It can be reddish blue, it's purple. Uh, next slide. It can't be reddish green because red and green, it's yellow. And this is how experience, you know, full stop. It can't be bluish yellow because it's achromatic. So this is the way we, we function. And why do we function like that? No, yes, the color circle of uh, airing. Actually, you know, a color circle is exactly the type of color of representation that we have normal trichromat. And as you see, uh, there is two opponent acts uh, where there is a blue and the yellow because they can't mix up. If they mix up as a light, they produce another completely different percept. And there is red and green, uh, which is the second axe. And in between, we have the four binary color. And if we do that, we can. It's a full color spec. It's a full color circle that we are experiencing. Next slide, please. And this has been expressed. No, 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 no. <laughs> uh, so we stay here. Th this has been expressed by um, Ehring uh, to give us an explanation of um, how this color appearance. Uh, domain is actually enacted, arise. Uh, this could be conceived that at the retinal level, um, we have three types of receptor. I mean, most of us do have three types of receptor, which are here 
uh, represented by the triangle. And one is, is in the long uh, wavelength part of the light. The second is in medium part of the light. And the third is a short uh, wavelength part of the light. So actually, you know, the full chromatic spectrum is divided in three. And we do have photoreceptors that are more sensitive to this uh, sweet part of the spectrum. Now, just after the photoreceptors, there is the ganglion cells, the cells which are in the retina, where the, um, where the um, output of the photoreceptor combine to actually set up those two systems. So they combine in the way for the red green openancies that we see is a long wavelength photoreceptor are antagonistly connected to the medium. And for the blue green, the blue yellow, the uh, yellow is provided by the combined uh, connection between how um, red and green photoreceptor opposed to how blue photoreceptor. So we have a mechanistic representation of that, which has been shown electrophysiologically speaking. So we are very happy. We have two systems in our retina. And then we can actually make prediction from that. And one prediction that I would like to make is that if, I, um, if we are presented with uh, a green stimulation, which is a unique hue, in our retina, and then for long enough to exhaust the sensitivity or rather to reduce the sensitivity of our photoreceptor. If I remove this uh, stimulation and present a uniform achromatic background, then we may experience the rebound of the second component of those open and channel, which will be red, yes? In other words, if I tired your retina, if we are tiring our retina, because it's what we are going to do in a minute, with one patch of color, when the stimulation is removed, then we will experience the functioning of our biological system. We will experience that. We call that after image. It's, I want to add a layer of um, complexity to that. Because you see that we have red green, we, we, we don't do the experiment with the yellow blue. But with the red green, the first we, we will all experience our after image. And it's exactly what we are going to do. We are going to present uh, the red and green patch fixed on the retina. So what you will what we will have to do is to try not to move our eyes on this stimulation. And then we will remove the slide to put a gray background and we will experience how after image. I want you to keep a record of the color of your after image. Be careful, they fade away very quickly um, and they move as soon as you move your eye movement because of course they are you know, uh, localized on your retina. So Joanna, we, do, we will do that with two couple of colors. So the first one is red green, and the second one is two other color. And I want you to keep a memory, or write down, what is the color of your after image. Um, Joanna, can we have the first slide for the first part of the experiment? We start an experiment. Okay, so uh, all depend how you are, but what will be nice is to have you know your computer in front of you. You fix the little star in the middle, and you need to be patient to fix it enough. Uh, so the stimulation is really tiring your retina, where it's actually projected, and the thing is because my, move, my eye movement is already there, I start to see the after image. So shall we move to the next slide? Okay, you keep, uh, you keep, you saw, everybody saw a colorful after image? Yes. And take, take uh, remember what was aware. Now, second slide. We do exactly the same. We have cyan, 
on the left hand side and magenta on the right hand side. And that are binary color. color. Remember, they are binary color. So we tired our retina. And then, Joanna, would you like to give us a uniform background? Up. Okay. So the thing is, the thing is, the theory doesn't work. Hmm? I mean, of course, it does work for many things. But for the after image, at least for me, I don't know for you, because these are your phenomenological color, because, you know, I don't know how your biological setup is. But I gave the two primary color, red, green. If we had a channel, whatever you call this mechanism, which was really red, green, I should have seen red and green. In the second part, we have magenta and cyan, which are binary color, and I see red green, don't you? So I don't know if there are students in visual system here in color, if you want to do some experiment with that, that would be nice. So that, that, that gives really a lot of uh, uh, argument to, uh, the inaction of color and the fact that there is also a biological substrat that can explain how appearance of color. Nevertheless, this biological substrat doesn't seem to have been really pinpointed precisely because you know the, the color, the phenomenological color we perceive with after image doesn't seem to coincide with what should be expected from a red, green, yellow, blue. Color open and see. Could I have the next slide, please? Uh, now, color as a perceived attribute. So, um, in a way, this is where I would um, think of color as um, elementary feature when when we learn about the visual system, meaning that uh, in the visual scene you get an object. And this object has shape, uh, so orientation, has uh, light contrast, has a position, and has also color. So the thing is, with the next demonstration, and it's something that we know since a long time, there is no one-to-one -one correspondence between the uh, physical um, indicator and the color which is perceived, a physical parameter, sorry, and the color which is perceived. And this is expressed by the, uh, the, the fact that there is uh, simply no one-to-one -one correspondence between perceived color and locally, locally reflected light. So next slide, please. And I, I'm sorry because um, just before I joined the, the, the meeting, my slides are not very good, but it, it doesn't prevent to understand the uh, the purpose of uh, what is called actually color constancy. This is one demonstration of it, and it's to show that you know there is no one-to-one -one correspondence with the physical signal and the color perceived. On the top, it's the original picture, and you see that there is a, a yellow cushion. On the left hand side, this is the original picture to which there was a very small filter added to the cushion. And on the right, it's exactly the same filter that has been added to the cushion, but this time uh, we're covering the full, the full um, picture. And of course, the, the idea is to say, well, you know, in the original with the overall filter, you don't see the cushion green, but you see the cushion uh, yellow. And this is because we have access to the overall scene. And there is a mechanism by which we are able actually to uh, we balanced the uh, overall um, light in the picture and be able to extract the uh, the color of each uh, object. So it's what we call the color constancy. And if you press the button, it's just uh, if you press next slide, you will get. Yeah, unfortunately, it's not very good, but you see this is exactly, you know, it's a part of the image it's just to, to, to show a demonstration that in terms of RGB value, uh, it's exactly the same 
uh, from the uh, left-hand side picture and the right-hand side picture, despite the fact that our perception is really robust in, uh, or in interpreting the color of this cushion. Uh, next slide, please. And of course, with color, we are, we, we are in a good domain to play with this sort of thing. We enjoy it very much because <laughs> with uh, color constancy, with um, um, uh, color contrast, and here is rather color assimilation, we have plenty of tricks to, to give to people. Um, and this one is uh, from Muni and Chivel in 2003, and they did uh, plenty of uh, this kind of uh, uh, display. And here it's rather, instead of color contrast, it's rather color assimilation. And the uh, patch in the center is the RGB value of the ring on the left-hand side, which is perceived as pink, and on the ring, which is on the um, right-hand side, which is perceived as orange. And that is just because the um, environment is uh, purple in the case of the pink and green in the, per in the case of the uh, orange. So it's where we, we, we talk about assimilation, but we have other things that show on the contrary, a color contrast where the color, instead of assimilating one with each other on the contrary, make big contrast. And many artists knew about this because it came from Chevrolet, uh, 19th century, and it was a time of impressionist, and they have been playing with that as well. But this is another story. Next slide, please. Ah, in 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 this section um, uh, about uh, color as an attribute of surface, the author went on that actually, you know, color also mingle with other. Um, uh, with other attributes in the visual scene. And they were uh, mentioning Kandinsky, uh, who had um, noticed that, you know, the, the color contrast, and what, what was interesting actually um, was that Kandinsky was also mentioning the blue and the yellow. So it might work very well with the blue and yellow contrast uh, that could, uh, in fact, induce some movement, some impression of movement. And of course, here you, you know that this is a static image. What, what I want to draw your attention with, and so this was done in 2003, and I'm sure that uh, the author would have been uh, you know, glad to see this kind of uh, uh, illusion. Uh, the first is normally it shouldn't, I mean, normally it doesn't, it doesn't move, the ring doesn't, don't move at the fixation point. When you fix a point, it's not where you see the motion. The motion arises, you know, slightly eccentric, eccentrically. And the other thing is, uh, if you carefully observe this, you get blue, black, and yellow contrast, but you get also yellow, black, and blue contrast. And depending on this contrast, the ring are rotating in one direction and the other direction. Uh, useless to say that I never been into um, um, motion perception, which I found terribly complicated. Uh, and this blew my mind, of course. <laughs> uh, next next uh, slide, please. All right. Uh, so in this same subsection, Talking about you know the integration of different uh, features for uh, an attribute of surface in the visual scene, um, the author referred to uh, uh, this uh, schematic representation of the brain um, and the retina because the first two modules at the bottom of the image is actually the retinal ganglion cells and then the LGN, which is the first relay uh, for the visual. Uh, uh, track and then the brain uh, with all these uh, modules uh, being interested in different uh, processing, as I mentioned earlier, being you know orientation, contrast, spatial frequency, uh, or um, location, speed, whatever. And some some may have. Uh, may, may keep a topographic mapping and some may not. Nevertheless, the idea is actually, you know, we need to have the uh, uh, coordination uh, of all this structure to 
perform a coherent and unified vision of um, perception of uh, how um, visual um, scene. And for that matter, um, while preparing this uh, review, uh, this lecture, I found this review, uh, which is very instructive, cortical map as a fundamental neural substract of visual representation. So, well, it's very interesting to see that uh, nevertheless, you know, visual representation map as a substrate for visual representation. So visual representation of the external world need to be there nevertheless. But what would uh, actually go on our argumentation and that of embodied cognition and structural coupling is uh, the fact that we find a strong evidence that vision is an active and constructive process from the very initial stage taking place in the eye, the retina, and from the very initial stage of our development. So we feel that you know this history of coupling, a constructive interplay between perceptual and motor system during saccadic eye movement is actively learned from early infancy and ultimately provide how fluid, stable visual perception of the world. I have also to, um, to confess that eye movement has always fascinated me, uh, despite the fact that many people who in fact do research on vision, and I will not say that I'm doing research on vision because of color topic, which goes from vision to, um, to cognition, ignore, ignore uh, eye movement. And the thing is, they are, this is a fascinating system because the eye movement should already be implemented with some cognitive abilities because it's such an intricate system uh, between um, how attention, visual search, et cetera, how higher cognitive process and the way that outside our control, how I am moving, that is also, you know, a, a, a very, very intriguing process. And indeed, you know, this um, work that shows that interplay between perception and motor system, it can be better illustrated with uh, vision and eye movement. Next slide, please. Ah, where is color? So um, another thing that I like in this um, in this uh, chapter is actually the author like to challenge themselves, and um, so they take they take the position of uh, radical uh, cognitivist uh, uh, information processing standpoint. So what it is? What is the point of all this complex neural process if not to compensate for the change in illuminant and recover something? recover some stable feature of the object. And they, they, they have a point, because actually, uh, why not to say that although we must account for color experience by revealing its constitution through emergent pattern of neuron activity, this experience is nonetheless a result of having to solve, to solve the information processing problem of recovering surface reflectance. And indeed, um, it is uh, unfair to say that uh, there was no stable signal uh, for color in our environment, because indeed, uh, at least for surface and whatever done with pigment, uh, there is a surface reflectance. And if you look at the image uh, in the B, you get. A, um, a representation of the light, whatever this light could be. And in that case, it might be a candle because there is a lot of red uh, light coming up. And the reflectance is actually the um, physicochemic property of the surface being a leaf, being a berry to uh, absorb or reflect the light. And what, what we see then, it's the light that which the human eye is actually uh, the uh, convolution of the two function, um, the, the combination of the two function. So we can understand easily that each time the, the light is changing, of course, the signal is changing. And that is the reason why we need to have a stable system that actually can discard 
the uh, illuminant. And that, that was the way that color uh, uh, constancy algorithm uh, started to work with, you know, to be able to um, discuss the uh, illuminant. So we need to answer this question, uh, whether, you know, <clears throat> Uh, Varela, uh, Thompson, and Roche has to answer this question. So next slide, please. So they start by saying this objectivist proposal gives rise to several considerable problems, which serve to reinforce our point that the color we see must be located not in a pre-given word, but rather in the perceived word brute force from our structural coupling. One, you are either unique and binary. We saw that. There are, so, there are no such a corresponding feature for surface reflectance so, so that they can be classified as being unique or binary. Nor can they be classified as standing in an opponent relationship to other reflectance. So it means that unique, binary, opponent system has nothing to do with surface reflectance, so uh, why that is, you know, there, there is something specific to the buildup of our system. The properties that specify that color are simply have non, no non-experiential physical counterpart. Second argument is the next slide. Color is not simply an attribute of surface, and we saw that already, but also a volume such as the sky, uh, and the light itself. We experience color as attribute of after image, as we saw, and in dreams, memory, and synesthesia. So th there is indeed, you know, uh, a makeup for color that we experience uh, beside the surface reflectance. The unity among these phenomena, so they are phenomena, is not to be found in some non-experiential physical structure, but rather in color as the form of experience that is constituted through emergent pattern of neuronal activity. Fair enough. The third argument, recovering of surface reflectance come, and that I like it because I can, I, I recognize um, some, some of uh, Francisco uh, characteristic of mine. Recovering of surface reflectance come from an engineering research program. This engineering should not be allowed to dedicate a conclusion about biological and ecological purpose that natural color vision serve. So next, uh, next slide. And this objectivist simply assumes that surface reflectance are to be found in some pre-given world that is independent of our perceptual and cognitive capacity. But how are we to specify what counts as a surface? I have to say that, that this question goes far beyond color. The determination of what and where an object is, as well as its surface boundary texture relative orientation, is a complex process that the visual system must continually achieve. Uh, this achievement results from the complex cooperative process involving active dialogue among all visual modality, as we saw with the uh, schematic representation of uh, the cortical map. The color on the surface goes together. They depend on our embodied perceptual capacity. And I choose an achromatic stimulus to provide a kind of intuition about what that means. This is the three-dimensional Kanitza destable image. It means that you get two interpretation of this image and you might have already experienced both of them. One is uh, considering a pyramid with the apex getting toward you, so sticking out, or you can also uh, consider the picture as a triangle aperture and looking towards the corner of a room, which is defined by three different gray. Now, what is interesting, because it's say, what do we define as uh, a surface? 
is that if you do consider the, when you get the percept of the pyramid, picking the apex towards you, then you will notice that the light, the uh, brightness, the intensity of light between the wall, because they are wall, I mean, you interpret them as a wall, uh, is higher on the pyramid surface than on the wall. So that works for the three different gray here. So you see just the difference of brightness. And that's because it has to be coherent with your percept. Now, if you move toward the corner of the room, of course, this difference of brightness disappears because it has to be a continuation with this wall, with your interpretation. Uh, it's what, um, without you know, getting uh, expert in color constancy, but it's true that the, the new, uh, I mean, the recent color constancy algorithm do, do include object recognition um, into uh, surface reflectance recovery as well, which help actually uh, the algorithm performance. So we see that here, uh, it's an intricate uh, system between recovering the surface reflectance and uh, object recognition. Next slide, please. So th there is uh, another domain with color, which is fascinating in terms of, uh, I mean, uh, what, what color as well, the fact that they are um, uh, meaningful. They, they, they also, the full color spectrum is not seen as a continuous uh, variable as it could be given by the wavelength. So, so this is also another departure, which is specific to our uh, appearance of color, the way the color appears to us, because uh, if you look at Newton's spectrum, and I forget to put a spectrum here, but it doesn't matter, you will immediately see a category of color in the spectrum. And actually Newton has been writing on what should be those categories. And that is also a debate uh, between indigo, blue, green, yellow, orange, red, and purple. Um, so we immediately see a category. We don't see wavelengths. And color as a category, uh, it's in itself a big uh, research domain. And here I'm showing you uh, what we call the Munsell color system, which is a tool that has been used to investigate color categorization. Uh, and you will see immediately what was the experimental question. And imagine that each little rectangle are actually a small um, sample of color uh, with different U, which is the horizontal line, uh, and then different saturation, you know, the intensity of the color, which is a vertical line, okay? It's a very bad representation of the Mansell, but you, you, you get the gist of it. So uh, next slide, please. If we, if we show this kind of uh, sample, there is 160, two people, and if we show them to English uh, people, what they do and ask them, could you kindly you know, set those 160 sample into category? Uh, we, we obtain you know, the type of uh, classification or categorization we see on the top, uh, uh, on the top uh, Mercator representation. And, and there is actually, you know, uh, 11, I mean, there is so many basic uh, color categories that can be uh, figured out. And if we do that in Berimno, who are um, uh, New Guinea uh, tribe, which is a Stone Age tribe, uh, we have a very, very different, very different uh, color categorization. And that, that was the support to say that actually uh, how perception depends on the um, on linguistic capacity. And this is a, the linguistic relativity of the hypothesis uh, that the structure of the language affects the way in which uh, speakers conceptualize their word. Um, I'm not going to be in this debate because it's still uh, uh, ongoing. It's a very interesting one. Uh, nevertheless, uh, if we move to the next slide, in uh, 1969, we had the Berlin NK, 
uh, who using exactly you know the same approach with linguistic, which has the uh, color term, uh, look at what was the color term in different cultures. Uh, they end up with a model uh, with this uh, post-cultural comparison, uh, saying that the more evolved the culture is, higher the number of basic color terms. And this number of basic color terms is between 11 and 12. Uh, as I, I am vague because that is another very active uh, research topic and I didn't catch up for what it is right now. So uh, I know that uh, even the number of basic color terms can be discussed. But what uh, uh, is still you know, um, agreed is the fact that um, if there is only two basic color terms in a tribe, uh, I'm saying tribe because obviously, you know, it's certainly not uh, uh, how well-developed um, colorful um, society. It will be black and white. Uh, Eleanor Roche showed that it was not only black and white, but it was black, cool, and white, black, warm, and white, cool. And there is also a distinction between warm and cool color. Then if there was another one, it would be red. A, a fourth one, it would be yellow or green. A fifth one would be green or yellow. And the sixth one would be blue. And here we, 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 rec we recognize, of course, the, uh, uh, the six uh, basic color, if we include the two black and white, with how system yellow, blue, and um, uh, yellow, blue, and red, green. Uh, and that th there is. Uh, agreement that actually uh, those basic color term or rather those basic category are universal. Uh, I, I have to say, because I've been working on color categorization and the, the influence of color on uh, the influence of language on perception. I think that most of the debate uh, come from the difficulty uh, methodological difficulty to address this question uh, experimentally. And I believe this is not the only domain where actually we reach our limit discussion norm, because actually the, the methodology is complex to address this type of question. Next slide, please. Nevertheless, um, uh, it's something I did too. Um, we, we are asking, the influence of language on perception uh, using normal uh, trichromat people across different cultures. But there is another paradigm that can be used, same culture and uh, different chromatic system. And it's true that, I mean, it is a fact that we have 8% of uh, Caucasian men who are colorblind. And the uh, studies that uh, uh, I did was asking color categorization uh, with the same 160 sample to color blind people. And, and actually the results were amazingly compar comparable to the normal track comat. So it means that individual with far different perceptual world uh, emerged in how trichromatic environment do behave, at least with categorization, in a remarkably similar way as the majority of people. And, and that was already pointed out by Jovic and Jensen, which are cited in the uh, book, because they are the one who did the experiment to figure out this color opponent channel. And they did a similar study, or rather I did a similar study with uh, Richard Jensen, because this, this, this was in 1978. And the title speaks for itself, Dichromat Color Language, Reds and Greens, the words, don't look alike, but the color do, meaning that they confuse the color, but they don't confuse the word. And what is interesting as well, and this is a big question, is when we put those individuals in a uh, only perceptive task where they could actually call upon the language to help them to resolve the task, they don't do it. So in other words, in a purely perceptive task, we see a lot of mis I mean, error. I would not like to call it error, but you know, different type of um, perception 
but uh, when they are called on the language, they can actually um, be much like normal triconats. So complicated. Color categorization depends on tangle hierarchical of perceptual and cognitive process, some species specific and other culture specific. Color categories are experiential, consensual, and unbodied. And um, I can only uh, agree with that. Uh, and that, that is what is nice between these experiential things, but the consensus with those diachromat people and also embodied uh, with the task, actually. They depend upon how biological and cultural history of structural coupling. So next slide, please. OK, uh, so uh, the cognition as an um, embodied action. Here, I, I will uh, propose you know, directly quotation from the book. Uh, the idea is to find a middle way. A middle way, and with color, it works well, between Silla realism, recovering from a pre-given world, and Sharibdi's idealism, projection of an inner world. Um, this is not the case with color because um, color blind are there and they don't project their own world because you know they they actually uh, understand and uh, enact their world very much as a normal trichromat. Um, next slide, please. So embodied cognition is the middle way. Color are not out there independent of our perceptual and cognitive capacity, which would be objectivism. Color are not in here independent from our surrounding biological and cultural world, which would be completely subjectivist. Contrary to the objectivist view, color category are experiential. And contrary to the subjective view, color category belongs to our shared biological and cultural world, which is uh, true, I mean true which uh, uh, so far uh, I could see that through experimental evidence. Uh, next slide, please. Embodied action. So now we come to definition. By using the term embodied, we mean to, I, to highlight, sorry, two points. First, that cognition depends upon the kind of experience that come from having a body with various sensory motor capacity, and two, that these individual sensory motor capacity are themselves embedded in a more encompassing biological, psychological, and cultural context. Next slide, please. In action, perception consists in a perceptually guided action. And two, cognitive structure emerge from the recurrent sensory motor pattern that enable action to be perceptually guided. Next slide. Uh, this was a quotation of Merleau-Ponty with the structure of behavior. And um, let me read you the second part of this. The environment unwelt emerge from the world through the actualization or the being of the organism, granted that an organism can exist only if it succeeds in finding in the world an adequate environment. Uh, I'll leave that to your thinking. Next slide, please. And the point that the author are making is their departure with this uh, sensory motor uh, structural coupling system to build up uh, and enact a word with Jean, Jean Piaget. Uh, because, of course, this is something that is also quite familiar. Uh, in, uh, in cognitive psychology, developmental psychology, that the sensory motor scheme are the um, foundation of uh, development, infant development. But next slide, please. The departure is the fact that Piaget, uh, as a theorist, never seems to have doubted the existence of a pre-given world and an independent knower uh, in a pre-given logical endpoint for cognitive development, because indeed his concept or the law of the cognitive development are even at the sensory motor, motor level, are assimilation and accommodation to this world. So this exercise of sensor, sensory motor scheme 
uh, despite that it was quite cleverly shown how they will build up one on the other to move to a symbolic thinking, uh, nevertheless need to adapt and accommodate to this pre-given world, which is not imply with an action. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, retreat to natural selection. Um, so likewise, we did it uh, for the objection of uh, surface reflectance. Here, uh, the, uh, so cognition is not simply a matter of representation, but depending on how embodied capacity for action, so it's where we are coming from, how perception and categorization are inseparable from our perceptually guided activity, and they are enacted by our history of structural coupling, it's where we are coming from. But an objection could be, However, this history is a result of biological evolution and its mechanism of natural selection. So how perception and cognition have a survival value? Is there an, the objection to that? Because to say that it has a survival value, it's probably imply you know, a pre-existing world in which we need to indeed adapt and be selected. And again, if we go back to color, is the structure of color appearance optimal? And we go to the next slide. And the way the author responds is uh, not sure that it's optimized because um, uh, in this uh, slide um, is shown the uh, photoreceptor for six different species. Uh, in A, these are the primates. In B, it's insect and the bees. In E, I need to read, it's a bird. In B, we have fly, water fly. And in D, uh, blah, blah, blah. it's butterfly. In F, it's the um, mantis, it's a stomatopod. So we see, we see that actually um, there is plenty of variance, uh, variability. And to take uh, the other words, there are vastly different history of structuring coupling in function of the different species, which one, you know, they are probably all well adapted to their environment. But nevertheless, um, for instance, uh, why we are only trichromat, why we are not tetrachromat. And as a fact of the matter, at the same time, I mean, there is there has been some evidence that some women, women primates, women, um, who are tetrachromats. There is some evidence of tetrachromacy among our species. And what, what would be the advantage to be tetrachromat, for instance? And next slide, please. And likewise, taking again, you know, this uh, paradigm, experimental paradigm uh, of uh, color blindness, since there is still uh, 8% of, of uh, men, Caucasian men who are colorblind, it is, it is uh, a question mark because 8% is a large percentage of our population. Uh, if there was indeed a, a strong pressure uh, for colorblindness, they, why, why there is still this uh, large percentage of uh, uh, of colorblind people? And this slide is also to show you uh, we get the uh, chromatic circle on the top for color uh, trichromat people. And in the bottom, it shows you what the color uh, looks like for colorblind people. And, and of course, you know, uh, when you have a color system with a higher dimension, we are trichromat, so we can model because it's the modelization, because we don't know the phenomenological experience of color, but we can model their co color world. Uh, but of course, we can't model the, the color world of a tetrachromat species. Um, next slide. And the dress again. For those who saw me, <laughs> I, can't, I can't help to show the dress again. So, um, and because again, uh, I don't know. Some of you may see it's blue and black, I do not, never did, and will never. And some of you may see it white and gold. Uh, that, is, that, that is really striking. 
Uh, and there is plenty of explanation. Next slide. But the explanation doesn't give the satisfying answer for experiential color, actually, because uh, one explanation uh, is that our um, uh, smart scientific community is given is this picture is taken, it's a very poor picture. And again, to make a unified coherent percept, we need in, to enact uh, a uniform uh, coherent percept because we can't, you know, it's what we are doing. And um, from the color constancy point of view, those who uh, see or interpret, see, uh, the gold and white is those who are making the hypothesis of a cool illumination. What we call illumination, it's a morning illumination. When, uh, on the contrary, those who see it black and blue are people I mean, who make the hypothesis. And when I'm talking like that, I'm talking from the cognitive um, information processing point of view, makes the uh, hypothesis of a warm illumination. So it's all we have to understand this uh, uh, ambiguity between us, and not ambiguity, but this individual differences, which is striking, because we are not talking about you know borderline, border category color. It's we did complete different percept. Uh, it's, it may have to do with our color constancy. It may have to do for the fact that we need to solve this uh, impoverished image. So in the context of uh, embodied cognition, we may say then that a coherent percept is enacted through the story of our structural coupling, which obviously might be different from some individual compared to other. And I stop here. That's wonderful. Thank you very much, Valerie. So uh, clearly a very um, deep uh, well of riches there for us to get stuck into. Um, but we might take a brief break. We'll keep a brief today if that's all right for people. So it's um, uh, 22 minutes past the hour where I am. If we maybe keep it to um, four minutes, say, so four, four maximum, absolute maximum five minutes. So if we look for um, 26 minutes past the hour or maybe 27, depending on where the second hand is on your clock. Um, and we will have some time for some quick discussion. We have a couple of questions to get us started, uh, but we'll give some priority to those in the room. And um, we'll hopefully be able to, to dig into some of this richness of color experience and indeed enacting experience more generally. So thank you very much. Um, but just, so, just such a wealth of material there. Um, and we'll see everyone in, in four minutes. I have a question. Yes, yes, uh, Sergio, you have a question? Yeah, hello. I have, a, um, I would say, a challenge. It's the following. Uh, there was a very interesting um, paper in 2009 in Nature of a genetic therapy for a monkey. It was a squirrel monkey, and the anomaly they are uh, dichromat. And they could then, um, if you want to say, recover trichromacity in this particular monkey. So your argument that, in fact, the color perception experience, I find this, of course, very interesting. It depends on the history of our, our structural coupling with the world. But in this particular case, the monkey suddenly starts perceiving uh, different hues. So it's, uh, how how will you uh, accommodate this um, this study in this framework of a structural coupling explaining color perception? And that, yes. Um, 
I, I, I am going to uh, to answer by a, a trick. Um, I will need. I, I mean, um, I see this job. It was uh, nets and nets work. Um, the, the thing is, do we have? Because I, I know that there was quite a lot of difficulty. Actually, you were saying that it was diplomatic monkeys, isn't it? Yes. Yeah, they, they are they, a new world of monkeys. The males are diplomatic, and then and the, the monkey was submitted to, to a gene therapy. Yes. And then yes. put 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 the opsin there. Yeah. And what happened is that uh, suddenly the monkeys now has a, a, a new color space, so to say, yeah. and is capable of recognizing colors. That it. So my question is, in this you know, particular case, the demonstration. Yes, I very much understand your question. Um, the thing is, um, uh, yes, uh, what I'm saying is, do we have, uh, is there, because it was 2009, it was nets and nets, it was very difficult yes. type of assignment to do, nevertheless, the, the result is there, we, we could, the I thing is, uh, do we have more of that, you know, uh, but it's yes, I do not know. Yes, I do not know. It's true that I do remember things that actually the main thing was to show that the uh, primate brands, and, and it's even more interesting because we are talking about male uh, new world monkeys, which is different from old world monkeys in terms of color. Um, yes. where, where able, brain was able to, to uh, handle a new uh, input uh, to create the, the a new dimension. And I, and I think that, that that was certainly spectacular. I will need to look at that the follow-up of yeah. this type of research, because I haven't heard it much more following that. But uh, no, I mean, to answer your question, I have no idea, Sergio, I have no idea. But what is how... interesting, if you consider, for instance, vision, vision, object vision, now how you perceive objects, it is known now, that the experience is extremely important. The way we interact with the, our history so to say, our ontology of interactions with uh, the visual world is extremely important uh, for our perception of objects. However, in this particular case about color vision, uh, if you can uh, restore uh, a missing um, component, and then you suddenly are able to perceive hues that were not, it's like that it's independent of the experience. And that's why I thought, uh, a very difficult question for you. It is. <laughs> it is. But uh, but it's interesting. It is. Uh, uh, no, no, no. But I keep that because um, I, I will speak to um, um, some people who are more, more informed than I am. Because the thing, as I said, first of all, you know, testing the uh, ability for color perception is not, it, it, yeah, is not easy. But no, it's true that they, they were recovering, and that was uh, um, uh, surprising because the uh, the narrative before that experiment was to say that it doesn't mean that you have uh, four photoreceptors that you will actually uh, uh, produce a new channel that could be uh, used by the uh, neuronal engineering, you know, because you could just it's what yes. we. Yeah, with, with a mantis shrimp, for instance, where 16 channel, it doesn't mean that uh, mm. she, the mantis shrimp has a color vision at all. Interesting. But uh, thank you, thank you, Sergio. But for, uh, yes, I read in your review for uh, experiment, uh, experience uh, coupling, the third dimension is, is, uh, is very important. Uh, for binocular vision, yes. when you are missing that, yeah. Superb, thank you. It's uh, lovely to see the discussion um, kicking right off um, and getting <laughs> straight into it. And uh, so thank you. And, and a really nice and really interesting question to pick up on it or to, to get us started as well. So as we are sort of returning to um, to sort of a, a, a fuller engagement from uh, across the group, uh, I will invite. So we have a couple of questions thrown into the chat here, which can get us started, uh, or continuous rather than get us started, given that we've already begun. 
Um, but if there are um, sort of any immediate questions in the, the Zoom room, as it were, please do raise your hand and we will follow up with those. So I guess we'll, what we'll do is, oh, uh, Hong Yu is, has raised your hand now. Um, I guess I have a much more naive kind of question. Um, but I'm just thinking of like, what would inactivism say about things like mental imagery and dreams? Because representationalists can just say, you form this um, representation and then you can just run them offline in dreams and so on. So what would a sort of explanation from inactivism look like? Inactivism for? Like what for for um, inner, I mean, for visual representation of color. Um, more like 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 a mental imagery. Like if you close like, your eyes, and then you yes. can see color. And if that's not a representation, then how would you explain that? Uh, but this is a naive but complex question. Um. Which, uh, because the mental representation are in itself extremely complex, um, in a sense that there is also a debate between um, do do are they the faithful you know are they the faithful projection of the visual stimulation and there are quite a lot of data showing that. Um, and particularly an example with Coslin with mental representation. Or as a propositional, so in other words, you know, it's a propositional will be the sort of the concept of, you know, the idea of. Um, so you you are actually, I mean, it, uh, I don't know what an activist will say about uh, those mental representation, because uh, as the way I see an activist in any case is in situation, meaning that you are uh, in uh, perceptual perceptual behavior you are you know in the world and you, you get the stimulation when when there is no stimulation uh, the nature of uh, the mental representation uh, as i said you know even of uh, a visual image uh, is still you know something to uh, to figure it out and for color, uh, it's uh, it's even more complex. Um, you know, for instance, I don't know if you get uh, if you you are able to answer the question of um, do you see a color in your dream? I'm not saying you know observing a scene and then closing your eye and then having a mental representation. That is still very different, you know, because you you can probably rely on some kind of iconic memory or whatever, you know, to, to keep the, the, the sensation of the stimulation and also to keep a faithful uh, uh, memory. But the inactivist, what, the, what would be, you know, the inactivist uh, 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 view of mental imagery? Um, we need to write the chapter. Thank you. Yes, I mean that is it is it's a spectacularly difficult question, but it's I think the, I, to which I, I'm not aware of any easy answers from the inactive literature either, Valerie. Um, the I think there is a an important point to keep in mind about our orientation in um, responding to that question. So there is a, a tendency within, for example, the, the mental imagery research in psychological science uh, to and in fact, this is a sort of characteristic of psychological science, cognitive psychology in particular across the board to present um, stimuli or images in a, in a manner which is kind of abstract and, and um, contextualized purely by an experimental setup. Whereas all of our other experiences have a before and after. It's something, there's a reason this particular image or this particular experience has come into being and it's going somewhere as well. Uh, and often that's calibrated by whatever activity we're engaged in at any given time. Of course, there are certain circumstances um, where we're sitting quietly, where we're meditating or where we're sleeping when 
that, that activity is not being continually calibrated with the world in, in specific ways. And it means that the whatever the, the standard ways in which our experiences are structured by our undergoing activity, um, and that is sort of easily introspectable, for want of a better word, um, those don't apply. And we need a, a different way of uh, approaching the issue and addressing the questions. Um, so Evan Thompson's book, Waking, Dreaming, uh, Being, is a sort of a, a wonderful resource on this one, but it's not I, one that I'm personally comfortable in um, summarizing. I don't know if there's anyone else here who might be able to throw in a few useful um, pointers to more uh, specific aspects of that text. Um, but it's, uh, I mean, it'll, it will be something that I would, it would be great to see a, um, a, a rich discussion on. Um, and I'd be curious as to whether others have suggestions as to what would be particularly useful resources there. Um, so please feel free to jump in. Um, if there aren't sort of um, immediate contributions, we can sort of throw them into the chat as they, they come to mind. Um, and one thing we might do is raise Marika's question from the chat, Marika Van Vuk had to head away. Um, she's off to, to dance, I believe. Um, speaking of um, in, embodied um, in, engagement in, in sort of real world activities. Um, but I think partly she wanted to uh, raise a question as to your work with uh, Francisco and how or what suggestions or advice that he might have given about uh, how psychological research can be undertaken how, you know, once you take this inactive perspective, once we are oriented by inactive cognitive science. Uh, so to uh, read your uh, question sort of um, directly, I would love to hear whether um, you have any suggestions for how cognitive science experiments can be adjusted to take into account um, theoretical framework of an action. Um, so the, is, there a, um, is there a specific change is it is, is i guess is is there a, a simple change in method does it really actually involve a change in the kinds of questions we ask um i guess that not wanting to read too much into marika's intentions here there might be a question as to how revolutionary this has to be can we get away with a few tweaks um or is this something that will really um necessitates just doing the science entirely differently do you feel um well, and and maybe uh, Sergio could also participate to this answer. So the, the thing, the thing which I've been learning, first of all, the uh, embodiment and inaction uh, concept um, are not easily put into um, experimental paradigm. Uh, um, and um, the, the, the other thing in terms you were talking about research, um, I believe what possibly limits our research hmm, is uh, uh, the quality of uh, the experimentation we are able to uh, design. Um, at the very beginning, when I was mentioning, you know, the toolbox of cognitive psychology, they are extremely valuable because there has been, you know, um, very valuable uh, experimental paradigms that could be implemented. The thing is um, how, I mean, those data, uh, and, and Francisco was also, uh, as I said, I'm, I'm speaking with the memory of uh, Sergio because I don't want to, uh, to, to have, interpreted what we, uh, how we perceive it. Um, Francisco was also very respectuous of uh, uh, the Western scientific investigation uh, because uh, they, they, they were extremely valuable, you know, way to uh, study and to do research. Um, now, um, how to change, how to change, there is no simple way to, to change the uh, the way we do research, I believe there is new technology, uh, but uh, I mean, essentially is to ask good question. And in order to ask good question, indeed, the first thing that we need to change is the, the overall model uh, of uh, the brain, uh, the mind. <laughs> 
it's the overall model that we have to, of the mind. I mean, the simple way that I can answer is actually uh, uh, when I came to uh, Francisco department, he gave me a paradigm that nobody had investigated uh, to investigate color. So I started by, you know, a, a very different approach to color. And that was very interesting up to the time where I had to uh, uh, confront all the other color scientists who came from uh, a different school. And that, that was very rich because um, uh, the, the way that uh, we investigate color with uh, Newton full spectrum uh, gave us, you know, a complete opening uh, of the paradigm to investigate different questions. Uh, but like the other, you know, like this sort of very inventive, innovative system, uh, as I said, this is not, is not easy. So to give you a short answer, um, and it's what I felt with uh, working with Francisco. The first thing is to ask the, the, the good question about. So if you think that the uh, cognition is um, uh, an information processing system, you can probably do very nice, very nice, uh, very nice uh, experiment and, you know, support your hypothesis and do all that. But... Uh, uh, aren't you just, you know, hanging up another information processing experiment or whatever? Now, if, if you do have, uh, uh, yes, if, if you have a more open mind and different conception of the, uh, of the functioning, uh, of the behavior, of the human behavior, animal behavior, uh, then you, you may ask, uh, you know, yeah, more subtle question. And uh... that's, I mean, it, it, it really is a, uh, it, it cuts to the core of the matter. And in fact, it means you, uh, can I ask you about um, precisely as you say that um, the, the experience or the, the orientation you had or the approach that you took in uh, collaboration with Varela uh, towards color perception, that it, it led you to ask questions or to engage with the research topic that was quite different to the, the standard models at the time. Was there particular aspects that stood out to you as well? This, this is what, you know, this is what I'm doing differently. This is what the, 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 the domain, so despite the fact that there is sort of a strong respect for the traditional um, experimental and, and research methods that were extant, is there, was there something that, what do you think most distinguished your approach from the other, um, the, the kind of the standard models that you ended up being in in some kind of conflict with? Um, but first of all, um, first of all, uh, this allow me to um, to understand chapter eight. I mean, what I'm saying is, it, 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 with color vision, we were we were there. This phenomenological aspect of color is not something that was pointed at the time where I was uh, doing my PhD. Uh, so th this aspect of color was not um, uh, was not uh, uh, well discussed and not discussed at all. And also the the physiological model of airing uh, first step of trichromatic vision and then color open system uh, done with computer because all, many of the experiments in psychophysics was done with computer, was, you know, the following the, following the past. Um, and um, and the, um, yes, there was a very strong hypothesis such as, for instance, the uh, uh, standard observer, <laughs> which, which, which was the inevitable tool used by everybody. And the standard observer is equivalent of the uh, uh, Piaget epistemic subject, you know, what it, what it is. And we were, we were able actually to get out of the standard observer. We were able, what, what I found with Francisco, at least, you know, with the, the it, it, we, it, there was freedom. Yeah. The, the mind was, there was freedom. So, um, 
this approach, um, which for a career reason, you know, because I've been doing other things, uh, has not been pursued as as, I, that, as it could have been. Uh, because also the experimental system was complicated and not it was much easier to do experiment on on with computer uh, but um, uh, yes um, this this approach could show could have shown you know uh, different understanding um, that was not possible when you had to use the standard observer for instance because it couldn't be, we couldn't with a standard observer, we are not able to pick up subtle uh, individual differences. Um, yes, I, I don't know if I, um, I'll give you a satisfactory answer to your question, uh, no. but you, you asked the very, the very important things actually, because this is what bothers me as well. Um, it's how to change, I mean, we don't have to change our experience experimental expertise, you know, because uh, there are fantastic things that are done all over the world in the uh, in different uh, department. But uh, what, what uh, I'm con slightly concerned is with what we teach to the young people, you know, what sort of framework. Uh, and um, yeah. It, it brings out nicely, I think, the um the difference between some of the ideals of scientific enterprise and the realities, the, you know, the ideal, as you say, there, the, we might have a scientific observer or, or sorry, a standardized observer, which is this abstract universal notion that allows us to coordinate collaborate as a bunch of scientists. Um, but of course, there's no, such, no one's ever been the standard observer. No one ever will be the standard observer. And um, the, the scientists themselves, we've got habits and we have ways of doing things and we have um, professional expectations and standards of practice that we're not allowed just mess with. We're not allowed just sort of turn around and change without sort of a prolonged period of activism to, to sort of suggest or to make um, arguments that they must change. Um, the, and, you know, we are naturally conservative in, um, people when it comes down to it, I think a, a lot of the time. So it is, it, and to, to see or, or to hear you speak that um, what, what was different about your research was that you took the phenomenology seriously. Um, you know, if we did the same for any aspect of cognitive science, it is likely to, to have those same kinds of um, rolling implications. Um, so we have, there is another question in the chat, which we might get a chance to get to, but I see Athol has his hand up. So if we, you have the mic. By the way, my mic has been having some issues lately. Sorry, you had the mic there at all, but only yeah. muffled for a moment. So exactly. if I can get you to repeat that. Yeah, my mic has been having some trouble lately. So I need to first confirm if I can be heard. Is that a yes. thumbs up? Okay. So Valerie, thank you very much for your presentation. And I think the the case of color perception is very interesting here because it makes the inactive paradigm very concrete as concrete as at least I have felt so far. Um, so color is not part of the sort of inner world. It's not part of a pre-given outer world, but it's part of the perceptual world is what they argue here. Can you maybe say a few words about the, the ontological status of this perceptual world, um, how we should conceive of it in relation to these older ideas of a pre-given outer world or an inner world? So maybe just a few comments on how you consider the ontology of this perceptual world. Uh, bon, you need to reformulate. Uh, you need to reformulate the question for me uh, because I, I, I mean, the origin of the expense of color vision or the nature. Yeah, if, if it's not part of an inner world or an outer world, but of the perceptual world. Um, how should we consider this perceptual world in relation to matter, in relation to mind? Where does it stand in relation to these traditional ideas of in and out? Well, um, will, will not that be this middle way that we need to conceive for? Um, well, let's put the thing differently. Uh, I suppose that objectivism can't answer all the question. Uh, 
uh, objectivism works because we do have all this technology of color reproduction, okay? We are happy. We are happy with the screen. We are happy with uh, uh, color reproduction. And that, that is the objectivism. We are able to do that. Um, but um, yes, um, and it's not subjectivist because, you know, I mean, to give very simple examples, there is uh, an individual who are colorblind, have a completely different visual perception. Nevertheless, you never spot them in their behavior. Uh, in the natural, I mean, in everyday life, you will not never, you will not spot them out as having a very odd behavior. So uh, they are not just living and projecting their um, inner conception, conceptualization of color vision. And in fact, for, I mean, I'm taking color blindness because it's easier for me because I need, you know, to have concrete uh, example. In fact, I think that the, the color world in which they are living um, is indeed, um, it can't be the, the um, representation that very sophisticated uh, software can produce uh, since 20 years. When I show you, you know, a, a blue yellow image of the color world of the uh, color blind, uh, because it's much richer. And this much rich, this richness, why it's much richer, I believe uh, compared to other species like uh, dogs, I'm sorry to say so, but your dog is like pomats and cats. Uh, it's probably because of the cultural influence, which the main component being language. So um, this is this middle way we are talking about, um, meaning that, uh, of course, there is a part of objectivism which is true. Um, Subjective, I mean, phenomenological color, we experience it to, together. So there are this, uh, meaning that, um, I mean, the question, the philosophical question, you know, is your red the same as mine? Is, is the, the, the color you saw are the same as mine, despite the fact that we all agree on the fact that we could give a name that we agree on? So, um, and the way we need uh, to accept uh, all these different experimental facts is indeed to uh, conceive that uh, uh, not if, I mean that we need to conceive this middle way of enacting uh, in a in a given situation in a given uh, physical uh, visual I mean visual scene physical uh, situation, social situation, how, how we will perceive those color, how, you know. So um, yeah, the, uh, the views that I, have, I think uh, I get out of uh, chapter eight is actually the, uh, uh, this pass uh, between objectivism and subjectivism. But again, I believe that uh, there are things that are objective because the technology is there to, uh, you know, uh, the, the color reproduction is one. The color reproduction is is one aspect. Um, Thank you. I don't know if you are, yes. Yeah, and that's great. So uh, Hong Yu, you wanted to come back in there. Um, kind of a follow-up discussion on sort of the ontology. Um, I was wondering whether you, it's possible to conceive um, the perceived world as a kind of objective property because you have um, sort of a, the perceiver and the perceived that are related, but then the relation itself is not really dependent on the mind. So, so then that has to be sort of objective, right? So because the relation cannot itself be dependent on the mind. Does that make sense? It does. Um, well, um, you mean it's, 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 uh, 
Yes, the relationship is stable, is what you are telling me. The relationship between the um, how color phenomenology and the physical world is stable. Um, I don't know if stability is what I was thinking of. It's more like just more broadly um, the metaphysical problem of how to think about it um, in terms of like a middle way. Um, because I'm thinking like if you have one thing that's related to another and then some kind of middle way emerge between, then the relation that emerges cannot itself be another kind of mind dependent property. So it has to be like almost outside of um, this kind of interaction, right? like, like the, the relation that emerges between the perceiver and perceived cannot itself be dependent on a perceiver. It's too philosophical for me. Um, I'm, I'm going to answer, you know, something completely um, off. Uh, where I come from, this middle way, uh, to me, is possibly a safe way to undertake experimental investigation. Um, in order to, uh, to, to possibly cope with uh, things that can't be explained, this dress problem on you know, individual differences, perception of individual differences, uh, the, only I, the only thing I can say is actually within uh, inaction and embodied cognition, th there is a framework that can explain, that could explain those individual differences. Those individual differences are not to be found in the, uh, are not to be found in the photoreceptor of the individual, you know, it's not, it's not at this level, are not to be found in, I mean, obviously, are not to be found in the physical world because we are all seeing the same stimulus. There is no differences. Um, so, um, yes, there, there is something. It's where I can I can feel where you know this emergence uh, between this uh, uh, subjectivity and objectivity to make the thing simple. You know, could actually emerge and make the percept, render the uh, percept uh, coherent and uniform, because it's where I see the challenge, you know. Um, I can't understand, you know, an information processing system in uh, which, which has different state, which has different stage that will need to be check up again, some kind of representation to, uh, to explain, you know, how this complexity come about um, in our visual perception. And um, I mean, um, Sergio will be able to say something. I would like to take Sergio on the board. Sergio would be, could, should be, if he doesn't want, he should, no, you should be able to say something about the poor quality of the retinal image. That 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 is very impressive. This is true. It's not only the poor quality, but uh, the sensing through the eyes, of course, is a is a very complicated matter. It's better to say you know, perception is far from sensation, visual sensation. And yesterday came someone here in my laboratory from. Uh, people working on devices. And he came with a very interesting question. He asked me how I could do a better device for creating virtual reality. 
And I said, uh, what's the problem? And he said, yeah, I would like uh, that we move the eyes and device is capable of tracking the eye movement. And the, the sensation you have in this uh, kind of a Apple Vision uh, device uh, should be better in a sense that you feel better when you move your eyes and you start tracking a virtual environment. And then he said, I think that the, a challenge in building a, a device like this is that the brain has, um, is capable of predicting what you will do in the future. Because of course you integrated machine, the things that you do in the motor system is integrated with your perception. So uh, in a sense, uh, you can always predict how you'll be vision in the near future when you are scanning the world. And this doesn't happen uh, simply creating a virtual environment. So uh, the point here is that uh, you have in this coupling with, uh, it's not only sensory, but it's also motor. And that this makes the problem for creating a virtual reality very difficult because you are not really coupled with the world in a sense that you cannot predict what will happen in the future. I think that these are the big challenges we have in neuroscience today. This idea of a predictive brain that you are capable of, um, um, so to say, even in specifically in, in terms of vision, that when you move your eyes, you have a kind of a, uh, information coming from a point in the retina and uh, to the fovea. These are very difficult um, problems that I would say depart from the uh, very notion of a simple representation where you have a stimulus and the response in the static uh, um, setting of things. So the, um, the idea of embodiment is, uh, requires not only um, a different thinking on the problem, but also um, um, technology, because it's much more difficult to, to think about these experiments. Uh, and that's why things, uh, I would say, are a little bit um, um, more difficult than we thought. It's not only increasing the number of electrodes, uh, but the, the very idea of having um, a subject that uh, is within a world and not separated from the world that makes things more complicated to um, to be um, treated or to be um, approached in um, in the lab. Uh, and uh, this is uh, this is uh, this is an a point that I see that is uh, very difficult. I'm that just adding. Said you have a question, and, and so I'm, I'm still thinking of, of your very interesting question as well. But I have a question. Do you think that indeed we are reaching some limit with experimentation to be able to? Uh, because I see that, um, I mean, the work has been enormous uh, to understand the visual system for, or to have a model of the visual system. But do you think that we? Well, then we need to go back to Gibson or, you know, ecological vision. And do you think I that... I think so, yes. This is 100%. Experimentally, we are reaching a limit because then what do you need in the laboratory to put this, you know, to start to implement, to implement life? I think that the, um, the representation of... The representational paradigm is uh, exhausted in a sense. Uh, we, we, we have been very successful in describing responses and doing all this. Uh, scaling up with a larger number of electrodes uh, is not really contributing too much. The point here is uh, to study the brain uh, in uh, that, uh, that is interacting with the world. This is, this is a challenge. But of course, it's, it's also, uh, we have new technology that allows these things that were not present before. So uh, I, I, see, I see a great future for, for vision neuroscience because of course, we will start thinking more on the vision as action. And this is the very, uh, this is leaving or going away from the representation idea. This is the point. Uh, 
And of course, uh, artificial intelligence and all this um, world that is opening with um, these things um, make make it possible. This is the way I see. So this is a, a lovely balance of perhaps um, criticism of the, the current situation and, and acknowledgement of the limitations of the current situation, but optimism for the future. Um, and I think maybe that's a, a nice balanced note on which we might draw things to a conclusion. Um, just uh, looking at the time, we're sort of running a little bit over. So um, we might sort of round things out there. I will say thank you very much once again uh, to Valérie for uh, your rich presentation and um, for all of your time. And we look forward then in two weeks when we will approach chapter nine um, in, under the guidance of uh, Ezekiel Di Paolo and we will continue. In fact, we'll get much more into this question of the middle way and that, um, Hong Yu, your question about the, the relationship between the, the perceiver and the world and how best to conceive of that codependent arising notion uh, that will uh, be substantially addressed in, I believe, in the next chapter too. Um, he says making a promise that someone else is going to have to keep, but we'll, uh, I'm just gonna just drop Ezekiel in that and we'll leave it there. Um, so thanks very much. Uh, Johanna, you want to uh, say a, a brief word about the upcoming events? Um, sure, I'll just mention a, a word about the, the Emily Friends talk we have next Thursday. So if anyone's interested to join the Emily Friends community, we have a talk by one of our um, association members who's a philosopher and interdisciplinary scholar. My interest, many of you here in the audience, um, she'll be giving uh, a talk um, next Thursday at 6 p.m. and you're know, welcome to look at the website and, and sign up for that and join the Emily Friends community. And as you said, next time we'll meet back here, we'll be on the 25th, same time, same place, same host, and we'll hear from Ezekiel de Paolo. So it should be a really, really important, um, important talk on a fascinating chapter. So thanks again, Valérie, and thank you as always, Marek, for your, your great hosting. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> My pleasure. Thanks for uh, giving me the opportunity to talk about color. Thank you. Have a good evening. Time. See you Thanks. next time.